Okay. <clears throat> so, my sermon entitled today is The Paralytic, and the story comes from Matthew 9, verses 1 to 8. So, we start at verse 1. Jesus had just traveled across the lake by boat, and he had, he had finally arrived at his hometown. It was probably a very nice day. The sun bringing warmth, and the sea bringing a nice, crisp breeze. This was his home. He was familiar with the area, and he probably had a few friends there too. So Jesus had just walked into town when suddenly a group of people brought to him a paralytic man. The man had come for healing of his sausage legs. Sausage legs, as I mean, they were just two flimsy pieces of meat attached to his body. So uh, he had not come for a piggyback ride, to chill with Jesus, to play a game, to go on a trip, or to discuss politics. He had come for healing. The man wanted to walk. So Jesus saw the faith of the paralytic and his friends. So in verse 3, he simply told the paralytic, your sins are forgiven. Did Jesus give him what he had come for? Yes, no, maybe, so? Uh -oh. Well, he didn't. The paralytic had come for healing, and Jesus had given him something totally different. So the phrase, your sins are forgiven, was the last thing he was expecting to hear. <clears throat> but let me share it with you a small fact. Back then, it was believed that if you ever did have a disability, it was because God was punishing you for something you or maybe your family had done. The religious, the religious teachers had taught this at the time. And the paralytic man believed this. He thought his disability was from God. And he was being punished for something he or his family maybe have done. And he had no idea that Jesus was God. All he knew that was, he was that Jesus was some sort of healer. Maybe he was doing it with magic. And if it was just magic, it would heal his legs, but not his heart. So when Jesus forgave the man, Jesus had given him what he had needed instead of what he had wanted. And obviously, to no one's surprise, the Pharisees were just hanging out close by. They overheard Jesus forgiving the sins of the paralytic man, and all they could think was that it was blasphemy, it was all wrong, blah, blah, blah. So hearing this, Jesus decided to take his actions one step further, and he healed the man's legs. And you see, all his life, two things had tormented the paralytic man, his sausage legs and God's disapproval of him. But of the two, God's disapproval was his biggest problem. Simply knowing that God approved of him, his legs wouldn't mean a thing. So God gave him what he needed before what he had, before what he had wanted. And so, in verse 6, Jesus tells the paralytic man to stand up, pick up his mat, and go home. And if you could just imagine the once crippled man just starting to stand up, his legs had, defined, had finally had the strength in them. They're no longer sausages. His legs finally... He slowly rised up under the power of his own two feet, his smile growing wider as his stance grew higher. The emotion shown through his face couldn't be described in words. It would, been, it, would, it would have been quite the sight. The man walked home in peace as he was healed both spiritually and physically. And you see, the point is that God knows what we truly need for healing, and he gives us that over what we want. God knows very well what we need, even when we don't realize it. Jesus heals the heart first, to what really matters. And so, may you come to know that God knows what we truly need and gives it to us over what we want, even when we don't realize it. After Jesus came to the city and healed the paralytic man, Jesus saw Matthew the tax collector. Tax collectors were Jews who worked for Romans. They would collect tax from their countrymen for the Romans. They were allowed to take as much as they wanted as long as they gave the Romans what they did to them. They became rich off their own people, and they were considered traitors. In short, everyone hated them and because they worked for the enemy. And Jesus told Matthew, follow me and become my disciple. And without hesitation, Matthew got up and followed him. Tax collectors were excommunicated from the community, temple, and synagogue. 
if Matthew followed Jesus, he would no longer become a tax collector and he would be welcomed back into the community. Sometime later, Matthew invited Jesus and his crew to his house for a party. Matthew also invited other tax collectors and sinners, and of course the religious leaders weren't happy about that. The religious leaders did not want to ask Jesus to his face because they were cowards. So they asked his disciples instead, why is he eating with such scum? Similar to today, sharing a meal with somebody meant you accepted them. It also meant that you welcomed them and that you were friends. The religious leaders have been working so hard to tell the people that they were not accepted. After Jesus, after the Pharisees had said this, Jesus was very frustrated, maybe even a little annoyed. Imagine doing your classwork and some idiot starts criticizing you with their nonsense, giving their unwanted ideas and Ah, and their ideas weren't even helpful. This is how Jesus felt. Um, I actually had a similar time to this when, um, when I was in the finals for hockey. Um, I was actually really nervous and under pressure. So, and um, the other player at the other team told me, oh, you're not gonna do it and you're gonna fail and don't even try. And that got me really, really mad. And that didn't matter because I didn't even let them score once and I made my team win the finals. So, uh, uh, <laughs> and that was when, and that was when Jesus said in Matthew nine twelve to thirteen, healthy people don't need a doctor, sick people do. Now go and learn the meaning of the scripture. I want you to show mercy, not offer sacrifices. For I have not come to call those who think they are righteous, but to those who know they are sinners. The Pharisees could not see this amazing thing Jesus was doing because they thought they were not as, not as bad as other sinners. From this point, let us remember, no matter how bad we are, Jesus wants to hang out with us. He wants a relationship with us. Jesus didn't come for the imperfect people, but for the imperfect people. May we come to see, no matter how bad we are, Jesus wants a relationship with us because he did not come for the perfect people, but for the imperfect. Good morning and happy Sabbath. Today, I will be speaking about a story found in Matthew 9, verse 18 to 26. It says, As Jesus was saying this, the leader of the synagogue came and knelt before him. My daughter has just died, he said, but you can bring her back to life again if you just come and lay your hand on her. So Jesus and his disciples got up and went with him. Just then, a woman who had suffered for 12 years with constant bleeding came up behind him. She touched the fringe of his robe, for she thought, if I can just touch his robe, I'll be healed. When Jesus arrived at the official's home, he saw the noisy crowd and heard the funeral music. Get out, he told them. The girl isn't dead, she's only asleep. But the crowd laughed at him. After the crowd was put outside, Jesus went in and took the girl by the hand. He commanded her to stand up, and she stood up. The report of this miracle swept through the entire countryside. So an important leader of the synagogue, Jairus, which translates to Hiero, comes to Jesus in desperate need of help. In Matthew 9, verse 18, Jesus is obviously the last chance for this man mourning for the death of his 12-year-old daughter. In fact, he actually leaves his own daughter's funeral in order just to find Jesus, and he refuses to accept the death of his daughter. Then in Matthew 9, verse 19 to 22, we have this remarkable story of a woman who has suffered for 12 years with constant bleeding. She comes through the crowd and comes up quietly behind Jesus and just touches the mere edge of his robe. She believes that by doing this, that she'll be healed. It's kind of like, for example, it's Boxing Day. And let's say the iPhone 7 is out and you really want to get it. And you're right in front of Future Shop, but all of a sudden in the crowd, you get a nosebleed. What do you do? You just stand there and everyone's trying to get that iPhone 7. This is kind of how the woman felt. Now back to Hiro's story. In Matthew 9, verse 23 to 26, Jesus arrives at Hiro's house and sees everyone crying for the death of his daughter. And Jesus does what seems to be the strangest thing. He says, she isn't dead, she's only sleeping. Try walking up to a coffin in the middle of a funeral service and pronouncing that the person is only sleeping. People would think you were crazy. 
So Jesus proves it to them and does something miraculous. He takes a 12-year-old girl by the hand and commands her to get up, and she does in that moment. You see, this particular story in Matthew is what I like to call a sandwich story. You have the bread and what's inside and another piece of bread. You have story number one, story number two, and then it goes back to story number one. There's a great interaction between the two stories, and they were put together for a reason. You see, we have parallels within these two stories. Jairus enjoyed the 12 years of joy that he spent with his daughter, while the woman was in 12 years of pain. Jairus comes boldly to Jesus, while the woman sneaks up quietly behind him. Jairus is a synagogue leader, and he's highly respected, while the woman is seen as unclean. Jairus has to wait for his daughter to be healed while the woman gets her miracle at once. The woman is healed publicly, and Jairus' daughter is healed behind closed doors. See, it doesn't matter who you are. We all face situations that may seem hopeless. All we need to remember is number one, just as Jairus left his own daughter's funeral to humbly seek Jesus, we too can leave behind the things in our lives that may be pre preventing us from coming to him. And number two, just as a sick woman had such faith in just the touch of Jesus to heal her, we too can put our full trust in him to be there for us when we need him. When mountains spring up in our lives and the things and situations and fears that we can't handle come at us, we just need to reach for the hand of Jesus. Reach out for the mere hem of his robe. Reach out for him. And his mere touch will restore our dried up springs with living water. <clears throat> Jesus had just brought Hiro's daughter back to life, and the crowd he had kicked out was outside amazed, making oohs and ahs. So one of the two blind men overheard the crowd speaking of how Jesus had resurrected this little girl. So he thought to himself, well, if Jesus could resurrect this little girl, surely, surely he could heal them. So they got up and started to follow the crowd. You could probably picture how blind men would follow the crowd. So... They started to feel around and touch people and yell and shout, Son of David, have mercy on us. So how would you feel if you, you were walking on the mall and some random person just came up to you, started touching you and shouting in your ear? Probably wouldn't really like it that much, would you? Now, in those days, people who are blind or have a disability, their belief was that they were cursed by God. So... The crowds were probably disgusted to have blind men touch them because they thought they were cursed. So they started to feel their way through the horde of people, and they finally got to the house. You could probably imagine how long it must have taken them to get to the house because the crowds were pushing them back, and they were blind, so they were constantly going in the wrong direction all the time. So it must have taken them a pretty long time to get to the door of the house. They walked into the house and went to Jesus. Jesus said to them, Do you believe I can make you see? They said, Yes, Lord. Jesus replied, According to your faith, be it done to you. And they were healed. Now, notice how the two blind men called Jesus son of David. They didn't refer to him as rabbi, savior, messiah. They called him son of David. This was the title for the king of Israel. They were calling Jesus the King of Israel. This was important because the blind could see what the crowds could not. So after they were healed, their lives weren't completely, completely perfect after that because it made it harder for themselves. They made it harder for themselves. So for example, if you go downtown and a homeless guy walks up to you and asks, oh, can I have $5? It's probably because he's hungry, right? So that's not how things work in the Middle East. How things work is if you are poor, they believe that if you are poor, God made you poor. If you are rich, well, God made you rich. And they believe that it was the poor, poor's God-given responsibility to beg and the rich's God-given responsibility, responsibility to give. So a poor person in the Middle East would ask, oh, can you spare a coin for me, please, sir? Don't think of it as giving to me. Think of it as giving to God. By giving it to me, you're giving to God. So they made it harder on themselves because they weren't blind anymore. They didn't have a disability anymore. So 
They couldn't, and they couldn't go into work. They couldn't go into town to find work or get a job because they had no work skills. And no one would feel sorry for them anymore to give them any money because they weren't blind anymore. So notice how they said, son of David, have mercy on us. What do you think they meant by have mercy on us? When do we finally ask for mercy? Well, we finally ask for mercy when it hurts the most and we can't take it anymore. So, when it hurts the most and we can't take it anymore. Even though they knew their lives would become more difficult if Jesus healed them, they were fine with that because they knew they would see God and that would give them peace. They knew Jesus was king and if Jesus was king, where was the kingdom of God? right there in front of them. So they knew that would give them peace. So may you come to know to be like the blind men, to want to see the kingdom of God more than anything else. May you come to have peace regardless of your circumstance.